welcome to Moments Orthodox Presbyterian Church for our evening service in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of the living God with silent prayer. Psalm 92, which is inscribed a song for the Sabbath. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to give praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be present in our midst tonight. Please turn with me to hymn number 275 in Trinity Hymnal, Strife is Over, the Battle Done, 275. God declare plainly that there is a God. 
but his word and spirit only do sufficiently and effectually reveal him unto men for their salvation. So they set themselves up against the kingdom of God. And what we find here is that the main actor in this chapter is not going to be Assyria after all. It's going to be the Lord God. And verse 10 is sort of the key turning point. I will arise. I will lift myself up. I will be exalted, says the Lord. And so the glory of the Lord will be revealed even in those countries that set, him, set themselves up against the Lord. Let America take warning. Isaiah 33, the word of our God. Ah, you destroyer, who yourself have not been destroyed. You traitor, whom none has betrayed. When you have ceased to destroy, you will be destroyed. And when you have finished betraying, they will betray you. O Lord, be gracious to us. We wait for you. Be our arm every morning, our salvation in the time of trouble. At the tumultuous noise, peoples flee. When you lift yourself up, nations are scattered, and your spoil is gathered as the caterpillar gathers. As locusts sleep, it is leapt upon. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. And he will be the stability of your times, abundance of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. Behold, their heroes cry in the streets. The envoys of peace weep bitterly. The highways lie waste. The traveler ceases. Covenants are broken. Cities are despised. There is no regard for man. The land mourns and languishes. Lebanon is confounded and withers away. Sharon is like a desert, and Bashan and Carmel shake off their leaves. Now I will arise, says the Lord. Now I will lift myself up. Now I will be exalted. You conceive chaff. You give birth to stubble. Your breath is a fire that will consume you. And the peoples will be as if burned to lime, like thorns cut down that are burned in the fire. Hear, you who are far off, what I have done. And you who are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, who despises the gain of oppressions, who shakes his hands lest they hold a bribe, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed, and shuts his eyes from looking on evil. He will dwell on the heights. His place of defense will be the fortresses of rocks. His bread will be given him, his water will be sure. Your eyes will behold the king in his beauty. They will see a land that stretches afar. 
Your heart will muse on the terror. Where is he who counted? Where is he who weighed the tribute? Where is he who counted the towers? You will see no more the insolent people, the people of an obscure speech that you cannot comprehend, stammering in a tongue that you cannot understand. Behold Zion, the city of our appointed feasts. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, an untroubled habitation, an immovable tent, whose stakes will never be plucked up, nor will any of its cords be broken. But there, the Lord in majesty will be for us a place of broad rivers and streams, where no galley with oars can go, nor majestic ship can pass. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Your cords hang loose, they cannot hold the mast firm in its place or keep the sails spread out. Then prey and spoil in abundance will be divided, even the lame will take the prey, and no inhabitant will say, I am sick. The people who dwell there will be forgiven their iniquity. Let us come before our God in prayer. Lord God, eternal, forever blessed, forever glorious. You are God over all, rich in mercy to those who call upon your name. You are most wise and powerful, holy, just, and good. You are King of kings, Lord of lords, our Lord and our King. You have no need of us, Father. Our goodness contributes nothing to you. But we without you are miserable indeed. We stand in constant need of your grace. We are ruined, Father, if your goodness does not come out to us and reach us to bless us. We plead for your favor, Father. We ask that your blessings come to us in Christ Jesus with all our happiness we know hinging on your grace to us. For your favor is better than life because it represents eternal life. We know, Father, that in our sin we have forfeited every right we might have to claim your favor. We've made ourselves completely unworthy of the least of your blessings. But you have directed us to come in the blood of Christ, cleansed in it from our sins. That he has sprinkled the mercy seat with his own blood, so that we now have access to your throne of grace. And so we ask, Father, that you will make the Sabbath blessed for us that you will show it us what a gift it is. You will show us how sacred time and sacred place work together by your grace to help us grow, to help us rejuvenate, Father, by your grace. Help us, Father, to see that the hurriedness and busyness of the world is not for us on the Sabbath, but that we would take a rest in the worship of your name. Take a break. That we would, Father, worship your name. We would see your gifts to us. Meditate on them. Rejoice in them as your people, the sheep of your pasture. We thank you for all your gifts to us in salvation, and in life itself, the promises you have given to us, the Holy Spirit poured out upon us, and your Son given for our justification and our salvation. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to turn in the Trinity Psalter hymnal to 92A. We'll stand and sing... 92A, it's good to thank the Lord.
Lord God of heaven and earth, you who made the earth in six days and then rested on the seventh, grant us this eternal rest in Christ, and grant us clear minds and open hearts to see its glory, to see your glory by faith, to believe what you have written to us in your special revelation, and to do what it says in joyful gratitude. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 31. We'll be looking at verses 12 through 18, and then at three verses, first three verses of chapter 35 as well. Start with page 84 of the Church Bible. And that's Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 through 18. Hear now God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. The Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave to Moses, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. And then chapter 35, verses 1 to 3. Moses assembled all the congregation of the people of Israel and said to them, These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. Six days work shall be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire in all your dwelling places on the Sabbath day. I need a break. How many people think or say that? And yet feel that they can't. And if they take a break, they'll fall behind on family, work, emailing, texting, their favorite TV shows. And if they take a break, they wonder what their neighbors or people in the church will think about them. If they take a break from doing good things, doesn't that mean by definition they're doing evil? Isn't it a sin to say no to something? Isn't it the height of virtue to be busy? Well, these are all important questions. The text we are looking at tonight helps us with some of the answers to those questions. What we see is that the rhythm, one day in seven, of rest is a tremendously healthy thing for us. In keeping one day of rest out of seven, we are imitating our Creator, God, and in doing it on Sunday, we acknowledge the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Well, the book of Exodus talks about the Sabbath on five different occasions. That's a lot. There's the occasion of gathering manna in chapter 16. And of course, there's the fourth commandment in 20. In the book of the covenant, chapter 23, another mention is made of the Sabbath commandment which says, six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female servant, and the stranger may be refreshed. And then the last two passages are the ones we're looking at tonight. The Sabbath is really, really important to God. Why else would it be mentioned five times in a single book? We also learn that though there is no other commandment out of the Ten Commandments that we are more likely to either misunderstand or ignore. Now, it must be admitted, it is almost completely ignored today in modern culture. 
How many businesses and sports do their regular thing on Sunday? Blue laws have gone the way of the dodo bird. People ignore it as if it was a burden. And that's because people misunderstand the Sabbath rather a lot. You can see it in the way that people ask the question, why do we have to keep the Sabbath commandment today? And that automatically turns it into a burden just by the way that people ask it. It's seen as an intolerable burden that weighs us down, keeps us from doing what we want to do on Sunday. But if we really understand the Sabbath, the way the Bible teaches it to us, we'll ask the question, do we get to keep the Sabbath? When we looked at the fourth commandment, I made the point that the Sabbath was a gift to all mankind. It was a gift. And if you look at the reason for the Sabbath in Deuteronomy 5, the second giving of the Ten Commandments, this becomes clear. The reason they were given the Sabbath in Deuteronomy is that they didn't get any rest at all when they were under Pharaoh's thumb. They had to work 24-7, and human beings are just not wired to do that. So what a gift a day of rest was. We cannot hear that too often, that the Sabbath is a gift, a tremendous gift. One of the main reasons that the Sabbath is given to God's people is so that we can know our God better. This is obvious in our passage. The end of verse 13, God says specifically that the reason that God gives them the Sabbath is, quote, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. How can Israel know that the Lord is the one who sanctifies them? unless they spend a day in seven learning that fact. It's an obvious truism, is it not? That we cannot really know someone unless we spend time with them. And if we decide not to spend time with that person, we're really deciding that we don't want to know that person. And God obviously wants us to spend time with Him. And the Sabbath is not primarily for physical rest, though it includes that, the rest has a particular purpose. It exists so that we can get to know God better. He's an infinite God. There's always more to discover about Him. So if we say, I don't really want to do that, I don't want to spend time with God. Are we not saying we don't really want to know God better? Anyone who profaned the Sabbath got a very severe penalty, did they not? It was a capital crime in ancient Israel to violate the Sabbath. Now that sounds unbelievably harsh to us today, doesn't it? But if we remember that the Sabbath is given so that we can get to know God better, and that knowing God is one of the most important, maybe the most important thing that we can ever do in life, and that knowing God means that we will love Him more, we can begin to understand why God takes the Sabbath so seriously. It's not because God is wanting us, wanting to put us in a straitjacket for our whole lives. On the contrary, from Deuteronomy 5, the Sabbath is tremendously freeing for us. Free to get to know God better. Free from the tyranny of the urgent. Free to rest in God. Why would we not want that? As Isaiah exhorts us in chapter 58, we should call the Sabbath a delight because in it we can know God better. And the day is holy to the Lord, as verse 15 says. The problem we have with the Sabbath in modern culture is that we tend to think of all our days as belonging to us. My time to spend how I choose. And if that's our attitude towards our time, we won't have time for God. 
So our attitude towards the Sabbath can reveal to us where our hearts are and what is important to us about time. One author puts it this way, the Sabbath is a tabernacle in time. A holy time. We've been studying the tabernacle in Exodus now for quite a few weeks. And we've been looking at sacred space, seeing how that, that tied back to the Garden of Eden, tracing its development through the tabernacle, the temple, Jesus Christ, the new temple of the Holy Spirit, which is the church. The connection between tabernacle and Sabbath is therefore very important to help us understand both. What good is a place of worship if you don't have time to worship? Space and time always go together. In fact, they define each other. We measure seconds by the vibrations of a cesium atom. Well, you have to have space for a cesium atom to vibrate. Well, it's also true with the sacred. You have to have sacred time and place. And we learn here, this, the Sabbath is placed at the end of the instructions for the tabernacle. It's at the tail end of all of the instructions of the tabernacle. We learn from that, that the Israelites were not supposed to build or construct the tabernacle, any part of it, on the Sabbath. That's the meaning of the otherwise puzzling phrase about not lighting a fire on the Sabbath in chapter 35, verse 3. That was the fire of metal making, the fire of the forge that was forbidden there. Now think about that for a second. How easy would it be to justify working on the tabernacle on the Sabbath? Isn't this the Lord's work? The Lord's work on the Lord's day? That would have been appropriate, they would have been tempted to say. And yet the Lord says the time spent with the Lord directly on the Sabbath is more important than time working on the tabernacle. As important as the tabernacle work was, that work was not the same thing as spending time with God himself. Keeping the Sabbath is healthy for us because not only are we spending time with God, getting to know Him better, we are actually imitating God. Now, of course, God needs no rest whatsoever. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't get too busy running absolutely everything in the universe the way He does. He's infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. He could not change from being untired to tired. And yet... God could have created this world in a single instant if he wanted to. Or he could have done it in seven days with no rest at all. But that isn't what he did. He created the world in six days and then rested or ceased on the seventh day. And that's not because he was tired. He rested in order to delight in his creation. It's the rest of an artist when he sits back and looks at his finished work and delights in it. It's very good, says the artist. That's exactly what God said at the end of the week. The meaning of the second half of verse 17 is right in line with this. That in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. It's human language to help us understand what God was doing on the seventh day. God being refreshed in this case does not refer to what a cold glass of lemonade does for us on a hot summer day. Being refreshed is God delighting in his own artwork. Last week we saw that the Holy Spirit had inspired Bitzal El and Aholiav to do the work of the tabernacle in a creative artistic way. And so the Sabbath is given in this passage as certainly a direct message to them that they should cease from their work and delight in God's handiwork. They were creating a new Garden of Eden in miniature. They were imitating God's work, His creation work. And so also then they should imitate their God in holy resting and delighting in God's creation. 
So this echoes Genesis 1 and 2 very clearly. This is one reason why enjoying God's good creation on the Sabbath is such an appropriate thing to do on Sunday. Jonathan Edwards often took walks on Sunday so he could enjoy the creation, what God had made, imitate his creator's delight in creation. And isn't that a nice break from the hectic week we usually have? And how could we call that a burden? Phil Riken says the Sabbath is a vacation for the soul. The Puritans used to call it the market day of the soul. Meaning by that, not that it was work, but that it was the way of furnishing the soul with what it needed. We take a break from the things of the world and focus on the Creator. And what we often fail to realize is how desperately we need that weekly rhythm of rest. We let the worries and the cares of the world choke out the Word of God so that it becomes unfruitful. And we're in nearly constant danger of doing that. Even when the cares and concerns of the world that we are thinking about in particular are ones that are good in and of themselves. Too often then our souls dry up and shrivel, even while we often pamper our own comfort zone. And sometimes we're tempted to think even on Sunday worship day that the rest of the day is business as usual, or maybe busyness as usual. God didn't say that the hours of 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. on Sunday morning are holy to God only. He didn't even say 9.30 to 12 is holy to God, or and maybe 5 to 6, or 6 to 7. He said the entire day is for resting in Him, delighting in Him. And that brings up the subject of the evening worship service. It's a quotation from a friend of Phil Rikens. He said, he had never known anyone who was faithful in attending evening worship to leave the faith or fall into scandalous sin. Now, I don't have decades of experience that would confirm that statement, but I have found that absolutely true in the 17 years of ministry I've so far spent. Someone will say, but pastor, aren't you being legalistic, requiring us to come? Surely the evening service is not as important as the morning service. But let's look at the mindset behind the question. Words like legalistic and requiring shouldn't be in the discussion, should they? The question is whether we get to go to those services. The question is whether we have the tremendous privilege of coming into God's presence again. Whether we will avail ourselves of the opportunity to get to know God better. This isn't the realm of obligation primarily. It's privilege. That word has a bad meaning today. But in the Christian world, the privilege of being God's children is not something we should give up to anyone. It's not a word that we should jettison somehow. So the Sabbath is not burden, but opportunity. It's a tremendous opportunity to get to know God better. And so many people let that opportunity slip through their fingers week after week. The morning and evening services should rank up so high on our priority list that practically nothing can dislodge it. Not because we're trying to earn brownie points by it, but because this is where we get grace in its most concentrated and helpful form. The last thing we need to see about the Sabbath is how broad the topic of Sabbath is in Scripture. It covers a lot more areas than just one day in seven. It's a far bigger idea than we normally think of it as being. The covenant of works that God made with Adam is a sabbatical principle. Adam was to work for a probationary amount of time, and then God would have given him the eternal rest as reward. And that, by the way, is the same rest that God entered into on the seventh day of the world. So the covenant of works is actually a subsidiary of the Sabbath principle. 
The covenant of works represents the Sabbath principle of thinking about work. And in the Old Testament, the work comes first and the rest comes after. Now, the covenant of grace was established shortly after the fall and pointed forward to the person and work of Christ. And when Christ came and suffered for the sins, for our sins on the cross, and was raised from the dead, the covenant of grace was brought to a glorious high point, a climax, and the resurrection of Christ speaks to the covenant of grace, and thereby the rest and works are reversed from the covenant of works. The covenant of works comes first, the work comes first, and then the rest in the covenant of works. In the covenant of grace, the rest comes first, then the work. And that's why the Sabbath is now on Sunday, the day of Christ's resurrection. Christ's resurrection accomplishes the first fruits of that eternal rest that is ours in Christ Jesus. So the entire covenant structure of the whole Bible is Sabbath. It's all Sabbath. Yet the final rest is not here. Hebrews 4 tells us, doesn't it? There still remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. In other words, we are not yet entered fully into the final rest that God entered into on the seventh day of creation. That still remains, and that's why we still have the Sabbath after the resurrection of Christ. It reminds us that Christ's resurrection guarantees that ultimate rest, and it inaugurates that rest, but we have it in a piecemeal fashion right now, don't we? One day in seven, in the new heavens and the new earth, it's all Sabbath rest. That's what it all will be. The Sabbath concept, in other words, is nothing less than a way of looking at the entire history of the world from the beginning to the end. From redemption, from creation to redemption to consummation. One of those wonderful connecting ideas in the Bible. Connects the entire Bible together. Similar to how the covenant connects the Bible together. So we see Jesus Christ. He's Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath rest waiting for God's people. Will we take advantage of it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this gift. Thankful for what it represents. The accomplished work of Christ. The conquering of death and sin. The obtaining of that eternal rest that Adam should have obtained but did not. And which Christ has now obtained. And has now entered. O oh Lord, prevent us from falling so that we might somehow fail to obtain that rest, but keep us in the shadow of your wings. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn with me to hymn number 392, O Day of Rest and Gladness. 392.
seated. Let us pray. The Lord God, you are great and merciful, kind. You are just, holy. We thank you, Father, for your gifts to us. The gift of the Sabbath. Make us grateful, Father, for this rest that prefigures the rest of the new heavens and new earth. Expand your kingdom through these tithes and offerings, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.